Exodus 10 and 11. I'm reading the Amplified Version. So, if you have your Bible, as usual, please open to Exodus chapter 10. And we'll read together. So please, if you have not listened to the last two messages, that's Exodus 7 to 8 and Exodus 9, I really, really encourage you to listen to it. It will really help in your understanding of what we are going to share. You know, these are not just singular messages, but it's a build-up, it's a continuation. So please... Exodus 7 to 8 and Exodus 9. If you haven't listened to them, please listen to them. But anyways, let's go into what we came here for. So Exodus chapter 10. Like I said, I'm reading the Amplified Version. The Bible says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants so that I may exhibit my signs among them, and that you may recount and explain in the hearing of your son and your grandson what I have done to make a mockery of the Egyptians, my signs which I have done among them, so that you may know and recognize that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, then hear this. Tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the ground. And they will eat the rest of what has remained. That is the vegetation left after the hill. And they will eat every one of your trees that grows in the field, your houses and those of all your servants. And of all the Egyptians shall be filled with locusts, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from their birth until this day. Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a trap to us? Let the men go, so that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God. Who specifically are the ones that, that are going? Moses said, We will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Pharaoh said to them, The Lord be with you, if I ever let you go with your children. Look, you have an evil plan in mind. Now, go, you who are men, without your families, and serve the Lord if that is what you want. So Moses and Aaron were driven from the from Pharaoh's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come up on the land of Egypt and eat all the plants of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled down in the whole territory, a very dreadful mass of them. Never before were there such locusts as these, nor will there ever be again. For they covered the surface of the land so that the ground was darkened, and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hill had left. There remained not a green thing on the trees or the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hurried to call for Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and pray and entreat the Lord your God so that he will remove this plague of death from me. Moses left Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. So the Lord shifted the wind to a violent west wind, which lifted up the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not one locust remained within the border of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that 
it was even more resolved and obstinate, and he did not let the Israelites go. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, so that darkness may come over the land of Egypt, a darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and for three days a thick over the land of Egypt. The Egyptians could not see one another, nor did anyone leave his place for three days, for all the Israelites had light in their dwellings. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go, serve the Lord. Only your flocks and your herds must be left behind. Even your children may go with you. But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings, so that we may sacrifice them to the Lord our God. Therefore, our livestock also must go with us. Not one hoof shall be left behind, for we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God. Even we do not know with what we will serve the Lord until we arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Then Pharaoh said to Moses, Get away from me. See that you may never enter, see that you never enter my presence again. For on the day that you see my face again, you will die. Then Moses said, You are correct. I will never see your face again. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will bring yet one more plague on, on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go. When he lets you go, he will certainly drive you out of here completely. Speak so that all of the people of Israel may hear, and tell every man to ask from his neighbor, and every woman to ask from her neighbor, articles of silver and articles of gold. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Then Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, At midnight I am going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the hand mill, and all the firstborn of cattle as well. There shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as has never been before, and such as shall never be again. But not even a dog will threaten any of the Israelites, whether man or animal, so that you may know and acknowledge how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these servants of yours will come down to me and bow down before me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. And he left Pharaoh in the heat of anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, yet the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the Israelites go out of his land. So, so far, God has visited Pharaoh with eight out of the ten plagues. And now it's time for the remaining three. Pharaoh has still been refusing to let the children of Israel go. The last plague that we saw was the plague of hail. So hail fell from the sky and it destroyed all the crops in Egypt. But some of the crops were still growing. You know when you plant crops, some of them have shut up. They've already come out of the, of the soil while some of them are still, they are still under the soil. So when the hail fell, it destroyed all the crops that had come out of the soil, like all the ones that had shut up. But I told you that these plagues happened over the space of a year. So after the hail left and destroyed the crops that had shut up, the crops that he planted before the hail came were already coming out of the ground. So they still had food to eat because those crops had, had come out. But God said he was going to send locusts and the locusts would destroy what the hail did not destroy. So when the, when the locusts came, the remaining crops that he had planted, the food that they were eating, 
the locusts came and ate everything. So there was no longer any food left in, in, in the land of Egypt, apart from whatever food that they had already harvested. But once they ate those ones, they were going to they were basically going to almost starve if God didn't have mercy upon them. So the Bible says the locusts came, they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees, and there was not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field. So imagine going out today and there's no green anywhere. All the flowers have been eaten. All the trees have been eaten. All the trees, all their leaves have been eaten. All the fruits, everything has been destroyed. The Bible says the locusts covered the face of the ground. So the locusts were so many that you can't even see the floor. You can't see the ground. Per se. All you see is locusts. The Bible also says that these locusts were so grievous that before then, there have never been these kind of locusts before. And after then, there have never been these kind of locusts. So the locusts were everywhere. So when they had eaten everything, destroyed all the food, and there was no hope of, of the Egyptians having any food to eat, because even if you plant new crops, the locusts will still eat them. So I don't know if you guys watch, I don't know if you guys have studied locusts. So even right now, when locusts travel, right, they travel in in their thousands or hundreds of thousands. They fly in swarms. They don't fly individually. And if locusts descend upon a farm, by the time they leave, it look like it looks like somebody burnt the farm with fire. Like when you see, if they were, you planted a row of crops and a swarm of locusts come, by the time they settle upon it, in a few minutes, they've eaten it, they've eaten everything. And when they leave, it's like you burnt it with fire. There's absolutely nothing left, only the stalk of the of the crops. So they had utterly destroyed the land of Egypt and there was nothing left. So Pharaoh called to Moses and Aaron and he now said, I have sinned this once. I pray thee, ask the Lord to forgive me and take away the plague. So the Bible says Moses prayed to God. God caused a wind to come and the wind cast the locusts into the Red Sea. But the Bible says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He will not let the children of Israel go. So the ninth plague was darkness. The Bible says God told Moses to stretch out his hand toward heaven that, they, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. And Moses did so, and the Bible says there was a, there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. The Bible says this darkness, you could feel it. So it's not normal darkness that we experience when, for instance, your electricity goes out or or maybe it's night time. This the Bible says this darkness was so thick they could be felt. This darkness was so thick, the Bible says nobody left his place for three days. So if you were sitting on your bed when the darkness came, when the darkness came. They sat down there for three days until the darkness left. If you were in the toilet when the darkness came, you were you remained in that toilet for three days. The Bible says nobody left his place for three days because of the darkness. The Bible says it was so thick it could be felt. This darkness is not normal darkness. If you put on a torch, you still won't see. If you light a candle, you still won't see. If you light a lantern, you still won't see. It doesn't just say darkness. It says thick darkness. You could literally feel it. But the Bible says in the children of where the children of Israel stayed, they had light in their dwellings. So after this darkness, Moses called to Pharaoh and now says, Go. So you know when Moses Pharaoh first started negotiating with Moses, at first he said, Don't go. But when as God continued to plague him, he now said, Go, don't go but you can start serving the Lord in Egypt, sacrifice to the Lord in Egypt. Moses refused. As the plagues kept coming up, he now said, you may go, but don't go too far. Moses refused. He kept, the plagues kept, kept coming. After a while, he now said, you may go, but leave the children. So all the adults go, leave the children. Moses refused. The plagues kept coming. But now, he has now gotten to the point where he now says, you can go. You can go with your children but leave your animals. And Moses said, we can't leave our animals because we must offer sacrifices and burnt offerings unto the Lord. So Pharaoh, of course, when Moses said this, he also refused to let them go. 
And Moses now told him that another plague is coming. God had told Moses that this is the last plague. And after this, Pharaoh was going to let them go. So the plague was the, the death of the firstborn. So the people remember that the people in Egypt worshipped Pharaoh as a god. The people in Egypt had many gods, right? But they, they divided these gods into kedas or categories. So they had, let's say, first class gods, second class gods, third class gods. Or if you watch football, you know you have you know how you have division one, division two, division three until the the lower divisions. So the higher the division, the more the more fierce the competition. So that's how they divided the gods in Egypt. They had division one gods, division two gods, division three gods. So Pharaoh was part of the division one gods. He was literally seen as as deity, as a god on earth. He was part of the most powerful gods in Egypt. So when the firstborn died, they would not have expected Pharaoh's child to also die because he is a god. So even if their own first children died, they would not expect Pharaoh's child to die. But his child died, his firstborn, his glory, his strength, his pride. And when they saw this, they would have seen that even Pharaoh is powerless against the God of Israel. The Bible says all the firstborn in Egypt died. Both the poor, the rich, both Pharaoh and those who were slaves, all their firstborn died. Even the firstborn of the animals. Firstborn of cattle, firstborn of sheep, firstborn of goats, firstborn of everything, horse, they all died. Apart from the firstborn of the children of Israel. The Bible says that on the next day, there was a great cry throughout Egypt. There was great sorrow. There was great mourning. The Bible says that kind of mourning has never been in Egypt before. And since then, they've never had that kind of mourning. So, this is where this chapter ends. Even though after this, we know that Pharaoh let them go. But that will be discussed in the next chapter. So, one thing that is very striking is, after they had negotiated, they had negotiated with Pharaoh to let them go over and over and over again. And he kept saying no. But after a time, he agreed. But he now said leave your animals and go into the wilderness and moses refused moses said we must offer sacrifices so you know how we've been discussing how pharaoh is a type of satan or a type of the antichrist to be more specific the bible uses uses one of the titles for the antichrist is the assyrian and pharaoh is also a type of the antichrist so moses who is a type of Christ trying to rescue his children from, from rescue his brethren from darkness. At first, he said, you may worship God in the land. And we discussed about how when you come to Christ, Satan still wants you to, He would if you've given your life to Christ, he doesn't mind as long as you stay in the world while worshiping God, but in the world. So he said, worship worship the lord your god in the land and moses refused he said we don't worship god and remain in egypt or we don't worship god while in the world we must leave there must be a separation after a while pharaoh acquiesced he now said you can go but worship god, but don't go too far so in other words you can go into this born again thing or christianity thing but don't be too serious don't take it too to heart right still be close to the world and Moses says, no, we must go and go as far as possible. We must enter into the promised land. There must be a separation. So after a while, he now says, you can go, leave your children. And Moses said, no, we must go. So that's what Satan does. After, when he notices that a generation has loved God too much and there's nothing they can do, he can do about that generation. He now leaves them. He'll say, you people, don't worry, go, go to heaven. I will gather your children. So that's what he's doing now, focusing on children, trying to turn them gay and transgender, and teaching them all sorts of ungodliness. Because the other generation, some of us have gone too far. There's nothing, even if he kills us, we'll die and go to heaven. So he says, don't worry, you people can go, but I will make your children sons of Belial. So that's what the devil is doing now, where he doesn't mind parents can love God all they want, but he will indoctrinate their children. So anyway, that's what Pharaoh was saying. You can go leave your children. 
And Moses said, no, we will not leave our children. Everybody must go. So he now got to a stage where he now says, you can go, but leave your animals. And Moses is like, well, how can we do that? We need to offer sacrifices unto the Lord our God. So Moses understood that the kingdom of God is built on the back of sacrifice for God's rule and reign to be established in a nation, in a kingdom, in a territory. It is all only done on the back of sacrifices. For instance, when God wanted to establish the nation of Israel, one of the first things he told them to do was to build a tabernacle. Eventually, that tabernacle was, became a temple. And in that tabernacle, sacrifices were offered on a daily basis, day and night. Sacrifices were only or always offered unto God. And the temple or the tabernacle began, be, became the center of Israel. Right, It was from there that the whole nation was established and the whole nation was built. The temple was literally the centerpiece of everything that went on in Israel. Even when they encamped in the wilderness, they encamped around the tabernacle. So the, the children of Israel, the tabernacle was in the center and they, they, all of them encamped around the tabernacle because the worship of God was central to everything they did. And in this temple, sacrifices had to be offered. So without sacrifices, there's no tabernacle or there's no temple. And if there is no tabernacle, there is no temple. The kingdom of God or the rule of God cannot be established in Israel. So if you study the nation of Israel, every time there were no sacrifices, that was the worst time or the worst period in the history of Israel. So for instance, if, if you go down to the days when they had forsaken the Lord their God, maybe in the days of Samuel, when his child or Eli, not Samuel, when his children were busy sleeping with the women in the temple, the Bible says because of his children, because of because he slept with women in the temple and and took of what they took of the sacrifices that were supposed to be God's own. The Bible says the things of God became contemptible in the eyes of the people. So people stopped offering sacrifices because when they brought their sacrifice, Eli's children would eat their own first before they sacrificed to God and they would sleep with the women. So people stopped offering sacrifices. And because they stopped offering sacrifices, the nation turned from God and the Philistines came and enslaved them to the extent that they even took the Ark of the Covenant away from Israel. So the downfall, turning away from God, right, and them being enslaved, it, stopped, it started from the misbehavior and the lack of sacrifices in the, tab, in the, in the temple or the tabernacle. All the times when Israel went into captivity, they couldn't offer sacrifices because, of course, you can't offer sacrifice when you are in, when you are a captive in Babylon. So the worst periods of Israel coincided with the times when they could not worship the Lord their God, and part of it was through sacrifices. So the kingdom of God is established on the back of sacrifice or of sacrifices. So we as children of God, in order to expand the borders of God's kingdom or the influence of God's kingdom, we must sacrifice. We can't live only for ourselves. So you would have thought that because there are more Christians in the world than Muslims, than atheists, than Buddhists, than any other religion, right? The ways of God should rule the earth. The things of God should be all over the earth. You would have thought that the values, the morals, of Christianity is what should actually be the most popular on the earth. But it's the other way around. Where anti-Christian values are being pushed, where even nations that are full of majority Christians, the whole nation behaves like they don't even know God. And the reason is the Christians who are there live for themselves. All they are concerned with is how they can make money, how they can prosper, their job, their business, their career, how they can get married and have children 
and build their business so they don't think of the kingdom of god in other words there is no sacrifice they only live for themselves so this is what pharaoh was telling moses go but don't take your animals but if they went without animals they can't establish the rule and reign of god there would have been no nation of israel because you can't remove sacrifice from the establishment of the kingdom of god even god wanted when he wanted to establish his kingdom he sent his son as a sacrifice so if we want the things of god to actually be established we have to go past ourselves and live for god so we've also been talking about the hardening of pharaoh's heart and we've been discussing how there are many stages of hardening right before you get to a place where someone now says Jesus is no longer God, or I don't receive the gospel, right? There are many stages of hardening. And today we're going to discuss them from the least terrible to the most terrible. So the first stage of hardening, right, of a hard heart, from the least terrible to the most terrible, is when you don't allow the Holy Ghost to lead you as a believer. You're already saved. Remember, we're going from the least terrible to the point where you now see there is no God. or Jesus is not God. So the first stage of a hard heart is not even sin. It's where you will not allow the Holy Ghost to lead you. So it's not fornicating, lying, cheating. That's not. It's where in your life decisions, you must do what you want. You may not sleep around. You may not drink. You may not kill anybody. But for God to say go left and you actually go left is very difficult is a hard heart a heart that is not malleable that god cannot just lead you is a hard heart so jesus said that we must become like children in order to enter the kingdom of god many of us are not like children because you have your own plans that even god cannot change you have your own desires that even god cannot change You set your heart to do something. Even God can't move you out of it. He says you must become like children. If you study children, you can change their plans at any time. When you have a son, the younger the child is, the more malleable the child is, the younger the child is, the easier it is for you to actually lead the child. The easier it is for the child to do what you want so if you have a six month old baby he can just be sitting on the floor he's playing you can just come and carry him and move him to your office and it's not a he doesn't even care it's not a big deal he can be in your office after two hours you just pick him and move him back to the house it's not a big deal so can god change your plans like this can god just come to you now and say this is what I want you to do. Something you were not thinking of, something you didn't plan, and you will just obey. When the child is two years old, you can still move the child. You can wake him up and say, today we are going out. He says, daddy, where, daddy, where? You tell him, you dress him up, you put him in the car. When you go, you can bring him back anytime you want. If you are relocating, you just tell your child, we no longer stay in Canada, we are moving to France. He says, okay, no problem. So your plans are basically his plans. Your plans are his plans. But as the child begins to grow, it becomes harder for you to actually make your plans his plans. A time comes when the child is no longer a child you now see this is what we are doing the child will now tell you that actually this is what i planned to do today <laughs> you now see this is what we are doing in this house the child is saying but i have already planned my own future at this point he is no longer a child but god says for us to enter the kingdom of heaven we must be like children For many of us, we are so set in our own ways. It's called the hard heart. 
that even when God is trying to shift you, point your attention in in another direction, you know. Sometimes you don't even want to. Have you seen when people don't even want to ask God for his leading? Let's say they want to do something and they have strengthened their heart in that direction. They will not even pray. They will not even say, God, what is your will? They will not bother because they don't even want any chance of God saying that what you have planned to do is not my will. So they will rather not ask God. Just in case God says, don't do it. They don't want to hear. So let's just do it, whether God wants it or not. It's a strong heart. It is. When you feel the impulses of the Holy Spirit, and He's nudging you to do something, but what you've decided to do, you enjoy it. You've set your heart upon it. You really want it, such that you know the Holy Ghost is nudging you. Then you now say... Actually, it's not even a sin self. This is not a matter of sin. This is just a decision. So even if I don't do it, it's, it's still fine. So you ignore the nudging of God. It's a strong heart. The Bible says, my sheep hear my voice. Have you studied sheep? Sheep are very obedient. Sheep are very obedient. You can see a shepherd, and only him is in charge of a very large number of sheep. You can't do that with goats. They are very stubborn. One shepherd can take care of a very large number of sheep. If you try that with goats, you'll be in trouble. So if you study Matthew 25, God says he will tell the sheep to move to his right. Then the goats will be on his left. So the sheep are the ones he calls his children. The goats are the ones that are going to hellfire. So sheep don't have their own way. They have they follow the way of the shepherd. Goats have their own way. They have their their own opinion. You struggle with whoever is trying to lead them. They must do what they want. They are very stubborn. You can't move them. Once they make up their mind, it's a fight. But sheep, they are obedient. The shepherd calls. It's not a struggle. They obey. So he says, my sheep. My sheep, they hear my voice. How come when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life's decisions, you block it because you already have what you want to do? How come you don't even ask God to lead you? You just live your life by yourself, by your own strength. You know, when the Bible calls us sheep, you need to study sheep. Sheep are one of the few animals in the animal kingdom that don't have the capacity to survive without somebody leading them. There are many animals in the animal kingdom, if not all animals in the animal kingdom, that can survive without somebody leading them. For instance, tigers, bears, lions. And even if you leave those ferocious animals, right? Rats. You can leave a rat. He doesn't need anybody to lead him. He just runs around. He fends for himself. You can leave a lizard. The lizard just runs around. fends for himself. Birds. Birds don't need anybody. They fly around. They find their food. But sheep cannot survive without a shepherd. They are not designed to survive without a shepherd. They will die. First of all, there are many things sheep cannot calculate. They can't calculate depth. So when you see a pit, for instance, you when, you, when you see a pit, and when other animals see a pit, they can calculate, I can actually jump over this pit. So 
a dog knows that this gap is too is very wide but i can jump so if he jumps he knows he will get to the other side if it's too wide he knows he can't jump he turns back sheep can't calculate so when they see a pit they can't tell whether i can jump over it or i can't jump over it so you see many stories of sheep just moving and falling into a pit so the first one falls the second one goes and falls until all of them fall because the way god designed them they don't have depth they don't have teeth sharp teeth like lions or like hyenas that can fight in the jungle and, and tear other animals to pieces they don't have teeth they don't have horns like antelopes that can you they can use to fight off fight off predators they are not very fast for instance if you chase a dog in the wilderness in the wilderness the dog can run fast antelopes can run fast gazelles can run fast so when a lion shows up they can at least try and run sheep can sheep can run very fast they can run fast they are utterly defenseless they are not wise enough they are very soft and cuddly they can't hide they can't camouflage they are white there's nothing white in the jungle so you they can't even hide in the grass so the way god designed them if they don't have a shepherd they will perish there are many other animals like dogs they are wild dogs who can live by themselves they are wild pigs who can survive by themselves they are even feral cats wild cats these little cats that you see in people's houses they have the wild ones that survive by themselves they are wild ghost goats there are many animals even small animals flies ants they need nobody they can live their lives alone but he says my sheep sheep cannot survive without the shepherd so you see many human beings the reason they are suffering <laughs> because they will not allow god lead them they don't know they think they are wise they don't know god calls you sheep he knows you don't have the capacity to live by yourself so when people try to live their lives without the leading of god all it will result in is calamity you will keep taking wrong decisions you will keep saying had i known i will not have done this that's how sheep will say had i known i will not have fallen into this pit that's why you keep saying had i known this one will not have made this one my friend had I known, I would not have married this one. Had I known, I would not have started a business with this one. Had I known, I would not have traveled. Had I known, I would not have left it. All your life, when you look back, it will be full of mistakes. Had I known, had I known. You make a decision, it's bad. You make an addition, it's bad. You turn left, there's trouble. You turn right, there's trouble. That's how sheep feel if you leave them in the jungle. Every turn, there's trouble. There is a wild animal waiting to kill them. There is a snake on the floor. There is drought. Farming is hard for sheep to survive. They eventually, they will perish. So when you see people suffering and wrong decisions, calamities, they are just wondering what's going on in this life. They are born again. No. They are sheep. They don't have shepherds. When you put sheep in the in the in the in the jungle, they suffer. What animals without shepherd suffer? So there are things that as a believer you are not supposed to suffer. Not just because you are in, if you are in Christ and you don't have a shepherd, you will suffer them. You will suffer it the way unbelievers are suffering. These ones are not just for us to say we are in Christ, so we will not suffer it. Is a is a joke. The only reason you will not suffer it is if you have a shepherd that will lead you. So, those without shepherds, there are things they suffer. Just like in the wild, in the jungle, the animals that don't have shepherds, there are things they suffer. So, for instance, the shepherd, he can calculate that a famine is coming. So, before the famine comes, he moves his sheep to a place where they can find pasture. In the wild, they don't know when the famine is coming. So when the famine comes, even the lion will die of hunger. As powerful as the lion is, he will die of hunger. So when there is a famine, even the strongest of the wild animals, they die. They die. But the sheep will survive. 
Sheep that are not strong. Sheep that can't fight. Sheep that are not wise. Not very wise. Sheep that have no teeth. They are not the strongest animals. Do you know why they survive? Not because they are stronger than the lion. But they have a shepherd. Who knows that a famine is coming? Who knows where to find green pasture? So he leads his sheep beside green pasture. Why are the wild animals will suffer? When there is a drought, the, 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 the shepherd knows a drought is coming. I have a well. I have, I have a well. Let's lead the sheep to the well. The ones in the wild, the lions, they are at the mercy of rainfall. Once rain doesn't fall, the lion will die of thirst. Do you know why the sheep will not die? Not because he's wiser, but he has a shepherd who says, from my belly flows rivers of living water. He is the water of life. He knows where the wells are. So he gathers his sheep to the well. He leads them beside still waters while the tiger will suffer. In the wild, other animals tear each other to pieces. Even the lion can be killed by a tiger, can be killed by an elephant, can be killed by a buffalo. As strong as he is, because he has no shepherd, he's in the wild. He can be devoured by other wild animals. But the sheep is protected by his shepherd. In the wild, when the sun is hot, it scorches the lion. When it's cold, it freezes the lion. But the sheep, the shepherd builds the sheep fold for them. He can gather them. He can light a fire. Ah! But if the sheep now says, I am an independent sheep, no need to trust in the Lord my God. You know, I'm very wise. My parents are wise. I went to school. You know, I'm, I'm 45 years old. I have experience. No need to depend on God. No need to pray before decisions. <laughs> the sheep now leaves the shepherd and goes into the jungle. <laughs> then the sheep is now complaining. This life is hard. People are betraying me left, right, and center. How will you know? How will people not betray you when you don't allow your shepherd lead you? You've gone into the wild. They would, in the wild, they tear his, his dog eats dog. You say, ah, this, this life is hard. Every time I make a decision, it turns bad. How come I don't have wisdom? Why are things just happening to me? Why are bad things? Why is, why, why is this? Why is that? Why is that? You have not allowed your shepherd to lead you. You know, every time you make all those decisions and you say, bad things, this one just happened, this one just happened, this one just happened. Things don't just happen. It is one bad decision or another bad decision, another bad decision that allows all those things to happen. If you ask yourself, all these things that are troubling me in my life now, that you're saying, had I known, I would not have done it. If you check, majority of them, if not all, you didn't ask God before you did it. Majority of the things that people that are troubling people that have become challenges now. If you ask them, they didn't ask their shepherd before they took those decisions. So now they are falling into a pit. They are in the wilderness. They are now crying for the shepherd to come and pick them from there. He says, My sheep hear my voice. Sheep have soft life. It doesn't mean you won't have challenges. But your shepherd will help you to navigate challenges that are not supposed to be challenges. You will have everybody that will go through trials. But the ones that have a shepherd, their trials are less. Their challenges are less. The troubles, the pitfalls that they have are less because they have a shepherd. So are you malleable in the hand of God? Jeremiah 10.23 do you know what it says? It says, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So, you know, when you talk about God leading people, people will now say, but you have a brain. Why do you want to allow God to lead you? You tell, you tell people, why don't you pray before you do this? You say, no, they will not even quote scripture. I say, God, I can't remember 
You now say, God gives you a brain. Why don't you use your brain? God gave you a brain so that submission can work. Can work. That's why God gave you a brain. Not for you to use your brain and not pray. Because when you bring this up, people say, God gave you a brain. Don't, you know, we have wisdom. So don't bother to ask God. God gave you a brain so that submission can work. The reason you can submit to God is because you have some capacity to do things without God. God has to give you the capacity to do some things without him. So that when you drop that capacity and say, God, even though I think I am wise, lead me. It is now called submission. If you never had the capacity to do some things without God, if God didn't give you a brain, then you can't say you submit to God. You are a robot. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. So the God that gave you understanding, he now says, lean, don't lean on it. You say, yes, I'm wise. Yes, I have a brain. Yes, after God gave you the brain, he now says, lean not on your understanding. Is it not surprising? Because even God knows. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. In other words, a man does not have the capacity to direct his own steps. If you leave a man, he will run into trouble. There is nobody that you will leave by himself who without prayer will take decisions and just be wise. It's not possible. He will eventually run into trouble. He says it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So God didn't create man with the capacity to live without him. It's not possible. It's not. It will be a very hard, terrible life with regrets. And people will end up in hell. So he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. John 21 verse 18. Jesus was talking to Peter. He says, when you were young, you wore your clothes. I'm just quoting it in normal English. He says, thou gettest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. In other words, when you were young, you just dressed up, wore your clothes, and did what you want. He now says, But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. In other words, when you were young, you just got up, planned your life, did whatever you want. He says, you got up, you wore your clothes, and went where you want. He now says, when you are old, you will stretch out your hand. Another person will take your hand and lead you where you don't want to go. He was saying, when you were young, you did whatever you want. When you are old, you will stretch out your hand. The Holy Spirit will take your hand and lead you by himself. So, on earth, we pride ourselves in independence. You know, when somebody takes decisions, you know, they say, I'm independent. They just gra gra, just do things anyhow by themselves. They didn't think they are mature. God says that's how children behave. He says, when people are young, that's what they do. He says, when you are old, you will stretch your hand. The Holy Spirit will grab it and he will lead you. He will even make you do things you didn't want to do, you didn't plan to do. So the sign of maturity in the kingdom is those that allow God to lead them. That don't just get up and do what they want. That don't just get up and follow their heart. That don't just get up, make up their mind and just run. Those are the ones that God says they are mature. He says, when you are old, this is what you do. So those who just run their lives anyhow, they are children in the eyes of God. This is, why, this is what Jesus demonstrated when he came. He didn't come as an independent man. He says, I do what I see my father do. He, you, know, he didn't, you know, nowadays, people pride themselves in, in, this, in their own strength. I did it myself. I calculated it myself. I planned it myself. It was based on my wisdom. Jesus says, I do what I see my father do. He says, my father walketh. He said to, I also walk. My meat is to do the will of my father. Everything was about his father. He was led by his father in everything he did. Jesus, demonstrating true manhood, was led by God. He was a sheep. He was a sheep. So the first stage of a hard heart is when God is nudging you and you refuse. 
Because you have made up your mind what you want to do. The second stage of a hard heart is where people don't care about the things of God. They are just using God to solve their problem. I'm not going to spend time on this one. That's the second stage. The third stage of a hard heart is where people sin and say it doesn't matter. So we're living in a generation where people will deliberately sin, then come back and beg. Pharaoh, this was the life of Pharaoh. You know, in the last chapter, he says, I have sinned. He didn't repent too. He just says, I have sinned. Ask God to take away the plague. In this chapter, he now says, I have sinned. Ask God to forgive me. So, in the physical, he was progressing. But actually, his heart was hard. He didn't want to change. He would still not let them go. So, he will sin. He will confess it. He will beg God, but he will continue. God said, this guy has a hard heart. Let me say it again so you can hear it all. And ask yourself if you are doing the same thing. Pharaoh will sin. He will beg God. He will ask for forgiveness. But he will continue. And God said, this is a hard heart. You know, people say we are under grace. You can be under grace and have a hard heart. This is the a definition of a hard heart. Pharaoh knows. You know that what you are doing, God does not like it. You know. You will go on and do it. You will come back and say you are sorry. You knew it was wrong before you did it. But in the hardness of your heart, you don't care. Do you know how hard your heart has to be? Do you know how hard your heart has to be? To know that Jesus suffered, shed his blood and died for sin. Then you will deliberately sin, knowing what Jesus went through. You are you are hard, though. You are very hard. Ah! You are hard. Knowing what Jesus went through, you will deliberately lie and say, God will forgive me. Ah, your heart must be made of stone. Stone! Serious stone. Ah! Stone. Your heart is like a stone. Some people do this numerous times a day, multiple times a week, multiple times a year. They are even living in their sin, knowing that God literally paid with his blood, suffered. Ah! Do you know what it means to be heartless? Do you know? When you see the suffering of somebody and you don't care. You know when you see people, you see somebody suffering and they will run over the person. You now look at him and say, why are you heartless? Ah! So you, you have seen the suffering of the Christ. How he suffered innocently for your sin. And in your heartlessness, you push away the sacrifice and you fornicate with your full chest. Then you have the gods. To come and say we are under grace. You lie, you cheat, you collect bribe, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, envy, jealousy. You are not struggling. You hold on to your iniquity and say, after all, God is merciful. You are hard-hearted to see the suffering of God and you will remain in sin. You are like a stone. You are Pharaoh. You are worse than Pharaoh. Your heart is as a stone. Ah! Hard-hearted believers. A church full of hard men and hard women, strong, strengthened in their iniquity. Nothing can shift them. You see, Jesus has died. You see, we know we will fornicate. Jesus has died. We know we will lie. Jesus has died. We know we will collect bribe. Jesus has died. We know we will hate our brothers. After all, God will forgive us. Is this not Pharaoh? The heart of Pharaoh. Knowing that anytime he prays, God will take away the plague. He knows. So he will continue to oppress Israel hard-heartedly. He will beg. He will come to Pharaoh. 
you say, I have sinned. The Lord is righteous. You know, you know all the Christian lingo, all the cliches. Father, if we are, if if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just. Even Pharaoh, he says, the Lord is righteous. Quoting all the scriptures, then when he finishes, and God for, takes away the plague, he will strengthen his heart and continue in his iniquity. Many believers, this is their lifestyle. They are so hardened. So hardened. They are like Pharaoh. Some people are so hardened, even with their sin, they, they can't even come to church. The hands that they used to collect bribe in their office, they come to church and they lift up those same hands. Are you not a hard man? You don't even have shame. No fear of God. The hands that people used to smush their girlfriends, they come to church, they lift up those same hands. I see they are worshipping God. What a stony generation. The mouths that people used to tell lies, they come to church and they are singing to God. They can't even be moved. They can't, it's not, you know, it's, you, you have to get to a level where your sin does not even bother you. You have become a stone. You know, the thing about always saying, you know, God will forgive us. God will forgive us. God is merciful. Then you deliberately keep sinning is that you will become hard. You know, the process of hardening anything does not happen overnight. If you open a, a can of Milo or a beverage and you leave it for air to enter, it will become hard. But it's not like immediately you open it and air touches it. It now becomes hard. No, sir. It takes a while. So, when people now deliberately continue to sin, what they don't know is they are strengthening their heart little by little, day by day, year by year. Your heart is becoming strong. So, the first time somebody lies, the first, very first time you lied, your conscience pricked you. You felt guilty. By the third time, the prick, it was not so hard. It was not so painful again. Your heart pricked you, but it didn't really move you. By the 20th time, you could barely feel it. Now, you are a regular liar. It doesn't even mean anything to you. Your heart is not like a stone. You know the first time, you felt it. When you lied, the Holy Ghost pricked you. You felt it. But now, because you are now a stone, you lie a hundred lies a day, a month. You feel absolutely nothing. You don't even feel guilty. You know it's a sin. You know, but you don't feel anything. Do you know why? You have become hard. The first time you fornicated, you cried unto God. Oh, you say, God, I'm so sorry. It took you two weeks to repent. But now, people fornicate, they get up and even come to church. You know the first time you cried, you felt guilty, you felt ashamed. You felt like, oh God, I've defiled. Now, now you are an expert. You do it on a regular basis and you feel absolutely nothing. You even get up from the bed of fornication and you come to church. Strengthened in the hardness of your heart. You feel nothing. You feel absolutely nothing. You know, when you first start this, let us sin, God will forgive us. You'll be, first, you'll be conscious of the sin. So immediately you sin. You will now quickly, quickly, quickly go and look for one corner and say, God, I'm so sorry, I just lied. I just fornicated. You, it will be like immediately, God, I'm so sorry. I just fornicated. I just did it. I'm so sorry. But when you now co deliberately continue, a time will come where you will sin, you will not even bother to repent. You will even forget. You will just sin and you will just be going. You will just be going. And when you accumulate the sin for like two weeks, you will not remember that, ah, it's actually been long ago. I actually told God I'm so Then religiously, you just come and say, God, all the fornication for the past two weeks, all the lying, all the cheating, all the stealing, have mercy. Your heart has become hard. It has become hard. You know, people's heart become so hardened to the point where they will not be defending their sin. Have you seen where people live in sin? You will tell them it's a sin. They will not be arguing with you. They will not be saying, you will tell somebody that what you are doing is a sin. They are deliberately doing it though. You will not say what you are doing is a sin. They will not tell you who is not a sinner. Or God, that's, not the, that's not the issue. You say who is not doing it. You see how <laughs> the point is not whether everybody is doing it. The point is you, you are doing it. 
is you. Leave everybody. If everybody is a stone, does not mean you should become a stone. You are telling somebody that this thing you are doing is wrong. They really don't want to change. So they can't admit that what they are doing is wrong. They will not say, all of us are sinners. Everybody is doing it. You. They will not be pointing fingers at you. They will not say, you. Are you telling me that you too, you are not doing it? Is the heart of stone. Is a heart of stone that you know you are a sinner. You are not broken. You are now pointing accusing fingers at the person who is telling you to stop. You have become stony. Because those whose hearts are soft, when you bring up their iniquity, they repent. They are like David. When Nathan approaches them, he doesn't now start pointing at everybody in Israel and say, well, am I the only one who has fornicated? Am I the first person to sleep with another? That's rubbish. He doesn't now start saying, am I the first person to sleep with another person's wife? He is broken. But the one with the heart of stone, like Saul, when you bring up his iniquity, he brings an excuse. You say, why didn't you Why didn't you kill everybody? He will not say, the people said, you know, when people start pointing at other people, when you bring up their sin, they are, their heart is like stone. Saul, stony guy. Samuel brought up his iniquity. Instead of him to admit, he now said, the, the people is the people is the people. So when you tell people what you are doing is wrong, he now starts saying, which one of us is not? You are a stony-hearted sinner. The issue is not everybody is doing it. The issue is God. Jesus died for your sin. And in his suffering, you are deliberately living in sin. So stop pointing at other people. Admit the stoniness of your heart. This is why they killed Jesus in Israel. Hard-hearted Israelites who will not agree that they are sinners. So when Jesus brings up the funny, they will rather kill him. So have you seen when you bring up, you tell believers what you are doing is wrong. They will rather kill you. They will hate you with a passion. So if you are the type that when someone tells you what you are doing is wrong, you now turn it to hatred. You are like the Israelites that killed Jesus. That's why they killed Jesus. They don't want to repent. Their heart is strong. So when Jesus says, no fornication, no lying, no cheating, no anger, they will rather kill him. So some people, when you bring up the issue of their iniquity, they will hate you instead. You are a hard-hearted believer. They now gather themselves in cliques like scribes and Pharisees. They now say, see this person always talking about this fornication, always talking about this bribery. Is he telling us that he's better than us? They now start to hate him. They now start to plan evil and to wish him evil. So on top of the lying and fornicating, they add malice, bitterness, wickedness. They are stony-hearted men. But they will come to church and sing and dance. Nonsense. Stony-hearted men. Hard, even in the presence of presence of God, can't even pierce the hardness. You can't pierce the hardness in their heart. There's a way you will progress in this hardness. You will not even want to hear the truth when they preach some kind of messages, and it's it's touching the hardness of your heart. You will change church. You will switch the message. You will not start liking. God will bless you. God will bless you. Prosperity. Those are the ones that that will be tickling you, as we say it in Nigeria. They will be sweeting you. Some kind of messages that come that want to break your hardness. You say, no, this 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 preacher, this message is too, is too I don't like it. I don't like the way the guy is talking. I don't like they just change the channel, they've changed church. But God will bless you. That one does not touch the stoniness in their heart. So they don't mind. They don't mind that one. Hard hearted. So once you catch yourself doing all these things, you are now drifting towards the sweet, sweet, tickly fanciful messages when you hear some other messages it's pricking you one kind but because you don't want to change you ignore it then you go for the ones you want you have become a stone when you can know that jesus suffered have you not seen people it amazes me they will come to church when you talk about the love of god they will cry shedding tears you will not be ah they'll say ah oh what god did for me oh jesus your, your your sacrifice on the cross oh god i love after they finish this heavy crying they won't lie so people just came to church and said every time i think of what jesus did for me i'm in tears they are broken they are willing they cry their makeup is spoiled when they finish they won't lie they will deliberately go and fornicate they, and you but you just finish crying you saw the depth of the sacrifice, you cried. But the reason you can go and deliberately fornicate and lie and say, God will forgive us, is because you are heartless. You are a stone. You can see the pain Jesus went through and you still deliberately sin. You are a stone. You are Pharaoh. Your heart is hard. Ah! Then when the Bible says the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, you know some people, when you decide you don't want to change, God will help you to be stubborn. 
when the Bible says God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, it's not like at the beginning God hardened the heart. When Moses first started visiting Pharaoh, from Exodus chapter 7, from Exodus chapter 7 to chapter chapter 8 and chapter 9, Pharaoh was the one hardening his own heart. God had not touched Pharaoh. So, you know, when they say the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, it's not like God automatically hardened Pharaoh's heart. So, it's like saying, I will clean my house tomorrow, right? But before I clean it tomorrow, let's say other cleaners came and cleaned it today. Or I say, I will clean my house next week cleaning it so me i came on saturday to clean it but on monday to friday other people cleaned it so when he says god hardened the heart of pharaoh it's not like god started out hardening pharaoh's heart pharaoh chapter 7 to chapter 9 chose to be stubborn so when god started to help him in his stubbornness was chapter 10 so that he can be destroyed so pharaoh chose stubbornness god gave him ample chances to repent he refused. Then God said, no problem. Since you have chosen to be stubborn, I will help you to be stubborn. Ah! And God hardened him till he was destroyed. So when you God tries to help you, have you not read scriptures? When God says that he tries to help you, he tries to help you to love him, but you now choose to continually rebel. God will harden you so that he can destroy you. But have you not read scriptures where the Bible says, he says, Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not. He says he has closed their eyes. Lest I preach to them and they be healed and they be converted. Let me look for it. I don't just want to quote it from my brain. This is Jesus. Who, you know, when you talk about Jesus, you now say, oh, Jesus is a God of love. You know, he's only loving, he's only loving. Let me, let me show you the scripture. Let me look for it, please. Just give me a minute. Jesus was talking about the scribes and the Pharisees that don't really want to hear what he's saying so he was telling them what he was telling what he was telling his disciples what he will do to them let me read to you matthew 13 verse 15. if you have your bible quickly quickly just open to it matthew 13 verse 15. he says for the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear and they have closed their ears so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me, lest I heal them. But if you read it in King James, he says, and be converted, and I shall heal them. So God was saying that these people, since they have refused, since they have refused to hear the truth, he will make sure that their eyes continue to be closed, and their ears continue to be closed, so that they will be hardened. And they cannot turn to him. Let me read another scripture to you. Isaiah chapter 6. Well, this is when God called Isaiah. And was sending him to preach to the people of Israel. So from verse 9. Or from verse 8. He now says. Who will go for us? Then Isaiah said. Then said I. Here am I. Send me. And he said, go and tell these people. See what God was saying. No? Go and tell these people. Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of these people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed this is the scripture jesus was quoting in matthew he says hear ye indeed but understand not see ye indeed but perceive not make the heart of these people fat make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. So when people decide that they truly don't want to hear the truth of the gospel, they hear it, but they want the one that tickles them. They want the one that will make that, that, that will allow them to be comfortable in their iniquity. Like Pharaoh, God will harden them. So that it can be destroyed. Let me read one last scripture that will buttress this point to you. Because you need to be careful. 
when god warns you about something and you continue and you continue and you continue and you continue you will not be very surprised you will honestly be very surprised let me read the scripture to you second thessalonians chapter 2 let me start from verse 9 for the sake of time so this is describing the antichrist he says even him this is the antichrist whose coming is after the working of satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness in unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might sorry that they might be saved and for this cause god shall send them strong delusion that they may believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness hmm. it says and for this cause because they receive not the love of the truth it says and for this cause god shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness so god says he will show them the truth and hope that they will believe it and hope that they will receive it but when they refuse the bible says god himself will send them what strong delusion that they will believe a lie that they will be damned why because they don't want the truth so when you talk about the hardening of pharaoh is not just pharaoh if you see the truth and you decide you want sin god can help you in your own sin if god wants you you see the truth he beckons you he waits on you and he tries and he tries and you decide it's not even his decision you have decided that you want stubbornness you want iniquity you want the wages of unrighteousness god we had in you in your own decision it's like those who decide to serve god god can help you serve him. you want to pray he will send you the spirit of prayer and supplication you want to fear god he will send you the spirit of the fear of the lord you want to know him he will open the eyes of your understanding or if your, your eyes will be enlightened you will have understanding if you want wisdom he will send you wisdom if you want to love him he will reveal his love in your heart so when people choose wickedness the bible says god will send them strong delusion so that they can be destroyed is their choice god will solidify you in your choice that's one of the me meaning of hardening to harden somebody in their position the one that they choose by themselves god will harden you in it so when you hear hmm, this is what is called the deceitfulness of sin deceitfulness of sin because people say they think nothing is happening every time you deliberately break the law of god deliberately your heart is becoming hard and this is how people continue until one day they, they get up and leave the faith so people say oh don't worry i will never deny jesus you are a fool though. you are a big fool people don't just get up and deny jesus it starts with little little sins little little sins and as they continue their hearts become stony to a point where they now wake up and say i am no longer a christian nobody just wakes up one day and backslides out of the faith nobody nobody it starts with consistent lying consistent fornicating consistent cheating as they are doing it their heart is becoming strong little by little little parts of their heart they get from a place of continue consistently lying to a point where they will not be defending their line defending their sin telling you that all of us are sinners from there they get to a point where they will not even tell you it's not a sin from there they will not backslide out of the faith there is nobody ah have you studied judas have you studied judas have you asked yourself what made judas follow jesus you know he ended up betraying jesus but ask yourself what made judas judas initially follow jesus you know now we are following god for many reasons he saves us from our sins he's leading us to heaven 
He will bless us. He will lead us. He will guide us. So he prospers us, etc., etc. God did not promise. Jesus did not promise his disciples all these things. Nothing. He didn't promise to bless them. He didn't promise them anything. He just said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. That's all. There was no promise of blessing. No promise of prosperity. He did, had not even told them about heaven. They didn't even know he was God in the flesh. So a man, Judas thought he was a man. He didn't know he was God. A man showed up to Judas. He just said, follow me. And Judas followed him. Judas left his job to follow a man he just met. The man didn't promise to, be, to bless him. In fact, he even promised him persecution. Jesus promised the disciples that they would suffer. No promise of blessing, no promise of heaven, no promise of prosperity, nothing like tithing, nothing like sowing and reaping. He promised them suffering. And Judas followed him. He left his job, what he was doing with his life, to follow somebody he just met. So it's like someone just comes to you today and says, follow me. Then you leave your job. You drop out of school. You now even leave the place where you are staying and be following someone you just met. You are just traveling everywhere. You leave Canada. You leave Nigeria. If today you are in Malaysia. Tomorrow you are in Sudan. Next morning you are in Afghanistan. You are just following the guy. Where the guy is going, you don't know what he's doing. You, do, you don't even understand half of what he's saying. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. You are not even understanding. But you are following. Why did Judas follow Jesus? Because he loved Jesus. Judas was committed. As committed as all the other disciples. Jesus didn't promise them nothing. Follow me. That's what he had. And Judas followed. But in his following, he now began to live in iniquity. Touch sin and not repent. And he continued like that. You know, he started with stealing. Ah, you know, you, you are a thief. Collecting bribe. You are saying you will not deny Jesus. <laughs> you are joking. No? You are seriously joking. You are a thief. Collecting bribe. Saying you will not deny Jesus. Judas, that's how he started. Stealing. Today, he removes small from the offering basket. Nobody catches him. Even if he catches him, he knows that. He knew that Judas, <laughs> he removes small again. He removes small. Small, small stealing. Small, small stealing. And you know the way you're saying, God is merciful, God forgives. You know, Judas knew that Jesus knew he was stealing. He knew. But he also knew that Jesus is merciful. So he continued. He's stealing from the purse. He knows that Jesus knows. But he knows Jesus is merciful. So he continued in his stealing. And as he continued, little by little, his heart was becoming strong. His heart was becoming strong. His heart was becoming strong. Until his heart became so strong that he would actually betray Jesus. So when people say, I will not deny Jesus, be very careful. Be very careful. It's a slippery slope that leads there. You don't get up and do it once. Little by little. Little by little. First, you will start with disregarding some parts of the scripture. The parts that talk about your sin, you will not want to see them. You will hate them with a passion. You will disregard them. Any church or any preacher or pastor that talks about sin, you will hate them with a passion. You will disregard sin. You will disregard them. Any believer that points out that what you are doing is wrong, you will hate them with a passion. You will hate them. You will disregard them. Do you know what you are doing? You are, your heart is becoming strong. Because you are hating them, who you are hating is Jesus. That's who you are hating. If anybody comes to you and says what you are doing is wrong, and instead of you to change, you hate them, you hate Jesus. Because that's what Jesus was doing when he came to die. If you go to any church and they are telling you that this your fornication is a sin, and because of that you turn away from the church and you now hate them, you are turning away from Jesus. If you open parts of the Bible that talk about that what you are doing is wrong and you close it and go to the part you like, you are closing some parts of Jesus out of your life. So what you are doing is your heart is becoming strong against the Jesus that you say you love. 
And when you continue strengthening your heart, one day you will get up and say, Jesus is not God. <laughs>